Hello and welcome. Uh, I love that little intro video. Uh, I'm just going to bring the slides up here. Any moment. Here we go. Uh, thanks all for joining. Um, today we are going to talk about the uh, European Union's uh, Cyber Resilience Act and its repercussions. Uh, both of those in the open source community, uh, project maintainers, collaborators, but then also for uh, the folks at home uh, building software. Um, we are on a pathway between um, the 19th of September 2024 and uh, 2027. It seems like a long way away, but um, if anything like me, you, you jump week to week, uh, it's going to come sooner than you think. Uh, so my name is Nick Peacock. I'm the Senior Director of Customer Success here at Cloudsmith. Uh, and really what that means is I, I work with um, Cloudsmith customers to, to make sure they're successful. Um, I speak often um, with, with people about um, securing software supply chain, artifact management. Um, and one of the things I've started to understand and learn more and more about is uh, regulation that's coming. Um, the EU CRA is one of those things. Um, so we're going to cover five key topics uh, over the next 27 minutes or so. Um, we're going to look at why the EU CRA matters, uh, why it matters to me and why it matters to you. Um, we're going to talk about what the EU CR is, uh, CRA is anyway, um, what the impact is on open source contributors, um, open source consumers. Um, we're going to work a little bit through how you should prepare for 2027. Uh, and then I'm going to give you some of my own kind of personal key takeaways. Um, this isn't just going to be a, hey, um, uh, do step one, do step two, do step three. Um, I'm going to give you some homework and get you to, to take away some, some uh, hopefully some things to think about. Um, so what is or why does the EU CRA matter? Um, in short, it's going to be a law. Um, it's going to be a regulation. It's going to be legally binding, and we and all of those uh, Cloudsmith included that develop software um, are going to be have to be compliant against the, the regulations that it's set. Um, uh, if I imagine many of you uh, kind of watching now, you're very used to things like SOC and FedRAMP. Uh, these two things are audit and for uh, like uh, compliance for audits. Um, if you're used to um, uh, voluntary standards like ISO 27001, um, every single year, or I think every three years, Cloud Smith goes through that, that same um, standard audit. Um, those things are different. Um, if you break a law, it's going to result in legal penalties. If you break a compliance um, uh, or if you, uh, if you fail these, then you'll potentially lose certifications and reputational damage. But I think we can all agree that that's not the same as breaking a law. Um, and then things for like broken standards, um, it's mostly going to, I'd say, um, result in the loss of a competitive edge. Um, if like uh, CloudSmith, um, SOC and ISO certifications are mandatory with doing uh, business, business with other uh, companies, um, you don't want to lose those things, but the ECRA will all need to comply with. Um, so um, I would consider this, um, or if you remember the process like GDPR compliance, um, I know five, six years ago, um, when it came into force, um, the scope of work is relatively similar. Um, you will have to prepare actively. Um, and this is going to cover a broad range of digital project of products. Um, this isn't just for um, uh, those that just build software. It's going to be for anything that there's a digital component to that, uh, that product. Um, and the next piece is, well, what is the EU CRA anyway? Um, Really, the whole focus behind the CRA is to um, is the aim to enforce and strengthen better cybersecurity protocols. Um, the The focus of the the bill, really, or the the law, will be to actively address vulnerabilities within um, within software, um, I, both for uh, consumer end users and business end users and to ensure that the software that they use um, isn't able to be exploited or in the best possible way, you try to mitigate any exploits uh, that have come that way. Uh, the scope of this is quite broad. Um, any product in big quotes, hardware or software um, that has a digital component um, could be um, impacted. Um, there are um, there's a timeline in place. There are a couple of revisions over the last 18 months or so of the act. 
Um, but later this year, it should be ratified and come, become law. Um, but it's likely to come into effect the back end of 2027. Uh, but if uh, you only think like the people that I speak to on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, change can be slow in organizations, um, especially more fundamental changes. Um, if you ask yourself how quickly it took you to become ISO certified or how much effort you put into those audits each time they come up, um, think about this as not a loss of reputation or a loss of certification, but a legal ramification. Uh, a three-year time frame is probably not a long time frame to be looking at. Um, and now what's the, we have to kind of understand the, the impact, but also the opportunities that this provides the, the community for open source. Um, and the reason why this talk and others speaking about the ECRA focus so heavily on open source is fundamentally because 90% of companies use open source software in their proprietary software today. Um, I think the number last recorded, I think probably more than 70% of everyone's code base for their proprietary software is probably made up of uh, open source um, software and code. Um, there is an example later in this slide deck that um, speaks to that. Um, so, so when the vast majority of your code is not written by yourself, uh, but you are still being responsible for maintaining it, it's really crucial to make sure that you understand how you're going to be impacted. Um, an initial draft of the CRA um, did not exempt uh, project maintainers or open source project maintainers. Um, they were going to be responsible for uh, vulnerabilities and contributions made to those projects. Um, so. Um, and, and again, I've got an example of this later on, for those projects um, where there are fewer maintainers and fewer contributors, it's really hard for those guys to ensure um, that vulnerabilities aren't brought in uh, maliciously or otherwise. Um, there was dodged, there was lots of lobbying from a lot of uh, different organizations. Um, and the, the CRA was redrafted. Um, but and now it just means that those guys are exempt. Um, but as a uh, private or a public company that builds software and um, th distributes that in the European Union, you are going to be responsible for every line of code and every um, bit and byte that's, that's in your software. So um, there really is quite a significant impact. Um, so who specifically is impacted? Um, obviously, if you have a hardware product with digital elements, you're going to be impacted. Um, I'm not going to read from the slide. You guys can all read it for yourselves. Um, the vast majority of software used in the European Union is going to be impacted. Um, the few exemptions are going to be for those that um, uh, maintain those open source uh, projects and softwares. Any very small or micro enterprises, even though these guys will still have to adhere to um, cybersecurity best practices. Any internal software you, you build, develop, and distribute won't be subject to the EU ERA. Um, and then also just those products that have um, uh, regulation and standards that already govern. Um, think about things like Dora or the NIS for network and information security. Um, they already have uh, fairly stringent uh, regulations, so this is for everything else. Um, Cloud Smith is going to be impacted, and I very much expect that if you are listening to me today and listening to my voice, um, I fully expect you guys to be impacted too. Uh, what next? Uh, so what is the impact on how you develop your own software? Um, uh in in short um or maybe not in short this is how you're going to be impacted um this is an example of um super agent it's just a small progressive cloud side http request library and this one package has nine direct dependencies and 25 indirect dependencies um and if super agent is uh, a dependency of your proprietary software it means it has 34 um transitive dependencies that it relies on to function. Um, if you have 10 dependencies, you could have upwards of hundreds, if not thousands of direct and indirect and transitive dependencies that your software relies on. So it's a, it's a complex ecosystem to, to, to view and maintain. 
Um, uh, Super Agent is a heavily used library. Um, it's downloaded about 9 million times a week, um, has four core maintainers and about two, 300 contributors um, and is a dependency for, I think this account was on GitHub, uh, 1.5 million different repos uh, that exist in GitHub rely on this uh, dependency. So any one of these uh, dependencies, direct or indirect, um, could be a threat vector. Um, anyone could go and try to contribute malicious or non-malicious vulnerabilities to any of these pieces. Um, so this is kind of a, a good example of where this the problem that you have to solve is, is relatively large. Um, if we look at this from a different lens, um, in just terms of quality, um, those in green um, are where those modules are up to date, those in red are where there's major updates. As you can see, just for super agent, there are there are two dependencies, direct dependencies here that have major updates that, that have not been made and um, that require updates to ensure um, compliance or or will potentially to uh, uh, require compliance in the future. Um, and then if we look at just in terms of, um, I guess, threat exposure in terms of maintainers, and if you overlap maintainers with module uh, recency of updates, you can see that most of those that are red have um, few, fewer maintainers and those that are green have more maintainers and distribute the work across from those. Um, we tell a story around core JS quite frequently where there was a single maintainer that for about 12 months wasn't able to maintain core JS. At any point, a malicious actor could have come in, released uh, or tried to push a contribution to that, uh, to that module. Uh, CoreJS is used by Babel and a bunch of other um, uh, other packages as a dependency. Um, it's used for backwards compatibility for websites. I, it, it was used by 52% of the world's um, browsers at one point, and there was a huge threat there. Um, so really, this is this is kind of the scale of the problem. Um, depending on the size of the software um, that you develop and distribute, you're going to have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of uh, dependencies. Ensuring uh, security by design is going to be incredibly tough. Um, ensuring that each of these um, are patched with the latest version um, are patched for any security or vulnerability updates um, starts to look and become quite a, a burdensome problem to, to bear. Um, but really, the it's not particularly, it's not necessarily complex, but it is, uh, it's not simple. Um, so this is a kind of a good example. And if you, as a uh, uh, DevOps platform engineer, as a software engineer, as an SRE, if you don't understand and don't have a good view on all of the dependencies that your proprietary code has, um, come and speak to me after the show, um, you should have a good view. Um, the EU CRA will determine and define uh, that you will you will need to understand exactly the, the dependency you're using and you'll have to prove that you are mitigating vulnerabilities that you are actively driving um, patches and you actually have a strategy for improving the quality and um, security of your software. Um, but this really is the considerations you need to kind of take away. Um, there's still several more slides, um, but if you kind of take anything, if you take anything away, um, it should be these. Um, you need to be implementing secure, uh, secure coding practices. Um, you should be looking at threat modeling and you should be holding regular um, security reviews. Secure by design means you should be mitigating a lot of the downstream uh, vulnerabilities that you have. Um, you should be reconsidering alternate uh, dependencies. If there are different libraries that offer you the same functionality that are better maintained or a better quality, you should actively start thinking about delivering the, uh, using those uh, in your builds rather than um, a lower quality, less maintained, less secure um, dependency, even if you've used that dependency for many, many, many years. Um, setting up, um, and, and this seems kind of a, a something that I, I think a lot of people do already, but setting up continuous vulnerability scanning is, I mean, it's going to be mandatory within the EU CRA. Um, creating vulnerability disclo disclosure processes, establishing a clear and articulable schedule 
for patches and updates, uh, you will have to tell the world what vulnerabilities you have in your software, or you'll have to tell the the auditors, um, either appointed by or uh, uh, pointed to by the European Union and the governing bodies. Um, you will have to build systems for rapid deployment and to ensure that you can effectively security up, uh, deploy security updates and patching, um, rather than looking at that report every 90 days and saying, okay, well, all of our vulnerabilities have been reviewed in the last 90 days. You'll have to do this proactively rather than reactively. Um, you should start thinking, if you don't already, um, about adopting international security standards like ISO and OWASP. Um, if you follow these best practices, um, such as kind of securing um, and storing sensitive data using in encryption. Um, if you start looking at things like S2C2F for securely consuming uh, open source software, you'll be very heavily on your way to being compliant uh, with these components of the, the CRA. Um, when it comes to um, risk assessments, you should look at integrating this into your software design phase. Um, risk assessments aren't just for compliance for SOC um, or FedRAMP or other compliance standards. Uh, you'll have to do this actively and um, the, the CRA um, suggests that you implement this at the top of that development life cycle rather than at the end of the development life cycle. Um, you should be regularly auditing third party libraries um, that you use within your supply chain for vulnerabilities. Uh, you should use secure software repositories um, to uh, offset man in the middle uh, or dependency confusion attacks. Um, you, should imp um, uh, you should be implementing uh, software composition analysis um, uh, in scanning for vulnerabilities, scanning for malware um, at, at the registry and repository level, at runtime, at build. Um, it, it may say, seem uh, like bringing a sledgehammer to a knife fight, um, but ensuring that at each of these uh, kind of core checkpoints, uh, you have secure software, it's gonna be mandatory. Uh, and once you put these things in place, you should um, automate them well. But uh, really a secure software supply chain is, is the aim of um, the CRA as a control plane. Um, you are gonna have to prepare for independent security assessments. Um, These are going to involve additional product testing, potential certifications, um, ensuring that you meet third party audit requirements like ISO um, are going to be part of the CRA. Um, I don't think we know yet whether they are going to stipulate the exact standards um, for audit or um, compliance. Um, but if you want to get ahead, then I suggest, and if you're already not, I suggest looking at things like SOC and ISO and OWASP. Um, or um, standards like uh, SALSA for supply chain security. Um, and as I mentioned previously, things like S2C2F um, for consuming uh, open source software securely. Um, you will have to update product documentation and anything customer facing. That is both the, an end consumer as a, as a person or a business user. Um, the material should include information about security features, um, updates, support timelines, um, you are going to have to provide and articulate um, clear end of life policies for secure up, for security updates. Also, um, the consumer will will need to be able to know exactly the actions they should have to take to ensure that the software they're using is secure. And um, you're going to be have to have to be more open. And um, ensuring the development teams, uh, your legal advisors, um, compliance officers, security teams all work together to implement processes to meet the CRA. Um, there are going to be penalties for non-compliance. Uh, this is going to take a village um, to, uh, to, to build a solution to ensure compliance. Um, it, it touches on so many elements of a business from security compliance, from DevOps to platform engineering, to software development, to product, to documentation. Uh, to your infrastructure, to the the actual um, mechanism you have for building and deploying software, um, it may require kind of a complete rethink of how you build and uh, develop and uh, distribute software. Um, the for kind of post market monitoring, you're going to have to develop monitoring systems. Um, 
to detect and respond to incidents like uh, vulnerability uh, attacks or cyber attacks. Um, you are going to have to log any security related events. Um, you are going to have to respond rapidly to those and you are going to have to notify a governing body of a breach. Um, rather than quietly uh, closing a vulnerability, you are going to have to um, uh, proudly and widely say that you have been subject to um, a vulnerability and subject to attack and you are going to have to resolve those things. Um, the, the exact definition of what those are, I think, are yet still to be determined um, in, the, in the policy and in the law. Um, but these, these 10 points certainly should go away and, and discuss internally. Um, so how do you prepare for all of this? Other than doing all of those things, um, what pieces can you do to actually prepare? Um, so I would talk more lightly about cultural and organizational factors rather than practical factors that will come next. Um, or beyond the practical steps, you should just adopt best practice. Um, it's not okay just to um, be the Wild West, uh, allowing developers to pull um, packages from um, uh, unmonitored, unregulated sources. And um, so adopting best practices like STC2F and Salsa um, will help you prepare. Um, they may not get you to full compliance, um, but they will certainly give you a good step in the right direction. Um, the one that I'm in personally um, enthusiastic about and passionate about is collaborating with OSS maintainers. Uh, you are the consumers um, of open source software. You you leverage. Um, they come with particular licenses for you to use and change um, software developed by another person or another group of people. You should go and collaborate with those those maintainers and those contributors. Um, I know and have spoken with many people, especially in the finance area, that um, actively contribute. Um, there are a couple of banks that are actually um, core maintainers for uh, critical packages for NPM and Python that are used by um, other um, uh, other companies in the financial sector, and they work incredibly um, hand in glove, incredibly well together. So, so go and go and contribute. Uh, don't just be a consumer, go and be a contributor yourself um, and engage with policymakers. Um, as with all regulations and laws, um, it is built on imperfect information. It's why through lobbying from um, organizations like the Eclipse Foundation, uh, the Open Source Initiative and um, the Linux Foundation, they um, saw a change and were the agents of change of a redraft to ensure that uh, open source project maintainers were not liable for the regulation, uh, but it still means as a private or public business who build and distribute software, you are going to be reliable for these things. Um, so these are kind of, I'd say, more cultural, more things to do as an individual. Um, start thinking about best practice. Um, go and contribute to projects um, and uh, and libraries that you and mod modules that you that you use on a daily basis to build your software. Um, and more practically, this is kind of what you need to do. Um, a centralized artifact store is critical. This is both for your private packages and for your open source packages and libraries. Um, this, as a developer, this should help you access and consume packages easier as um, uh, responsible parties, so DevOps, platform engineering, SREs, uh, being able to control and observe and monitor the artifacts and packages and libraries used within your software, um, that's going to be absolutely critical. Um, being able to um, build um, and manage dependencies um, is going to be massively important. Um, ensuring that you use um, uh, better access controls to limit um, exposure for software supply chain attacks like man in the middle attacks. Um, and then also stop using hard coded secrets. Um, use, use ephemeral tokens. Uh, OpenID Connect is a great standard for that. Um, I think one of the greatest things I see in people's pipelines are hard-coded API keys. Uh, you're going to have to move away from that, please. Um, I don't think that ECRA will be specific in mandating that, but this is just going to be best practice. Um, even if that token is exposed, it is ephemeral, it dies after a, a set period of time, I'd suggest less than six hours. Um, it's going to be important to ensure that you, you manage secrets properly. Um, you need to look at building a dependency firewall. 
scanning all of those vulnerable, scanning all those um, open source and uh, public dependencies you have, ensuring that they are not allowed to be consumed by those end software developers and end software and end users. Um, and building artifact lifecycle to ensure that you clean out and end of life um, out of date uh, or out of maintenance uh, artifacts and packages is gonna be incredibly important. Um, and then there are more advanced things that help you get towards um, supply chain security. It's gonna be things like attestation, provenance and, and software bill of materials, ensuring you have a, a better view on which artifacts and packages are used to build your applications. Um, ensuring that you don't just monitor the vulnerabilities you have, but actively go and um, manage them and uh, deploy patches. Um, having a 90 day window is probably not going to be much, uh, it's not be enough. Um, you need to be looking at things like art uh, package and artifact integrity and provenance. These are things like um, signatures and attestation um, and, and I guess provenance as a whole, ensuring that you can verify the signature from source and um, ensuring that the package that you have stored um, in your artifact repository is the same one that you're using to build your application um, through those pipelines as there been a, an attack in the middle. Uh, and then also just general policy management and ensuring that as an organization, you can in, uh, enforce and monitor compliance with uh, license policies and vulnerability policies and um, uh, even more, I, I guess, um, uh, solidly deny things from even coming into the ecosystem uh, like log for shell or log for j type dependencies or um or even stop uh, use of software that has um uh, licenses the organization uh, should not be using so really there is a there's kind of a, a general three-step process um i'd say these are not equally sized but artifact management dependency control is your it should be your first um if you don't have a clear way to control all of the artifacts and uh, dependencies that your so that your company uses. That should be where you start first. Having a universal centralized artifact management system um, is a uh, is table stakes. Um, next piece will be um, building um, a, uh, a compliant um, solution for vulnerability management. Um, this should be. They should look at license reporting. They should look at um, only retaining those um, packages that um, are critical to you. Um, and then the, the last piece is going to be more advanced pieces like audit logging, um, ensuring that you monitor who uses and downloads those packages, making sure your uh, vulnerability policies, um, artifact signing, and package verification are, are two also incredibly important pieces. Um, we are out of uh, almost out of time. Um, I'd say these are the key takeaways. Um, for the last 30 seconds, I'd say the the, the pieces to take away are um, identify and understand the solution that you need to put in place to build and maintain a secure software supply chain. Um, be prepared for the regulation that is coming. It will be legally binding. Um, identify the impact to your product and service now. Don't wait until 2027. Um, and then get serious uh, about security by design. Um, the, the the more you do upstream in the software and product development life cycle, the easier it's going to be once you're actually going and building and managing that software. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, scan the QR code if you'd like any of the slides uh, or would like to hear my voice further. Thanks.